But you'll notice any time anybody mentions any problems with this engine, 80% of the time they'll say something about CCV. And that's because that is the biggest weakness of the M54 is that CCV system. So welcome back to another video here. This one is again on my 525i. And I recently got a check engine light, which gave me these two engine codes. These codes correspond to a lean condition on bank one, which is cylinders one, two, and three, and bank two, which is cylinders four, five, and six. These codes can be caused by many different things. And this intro here is actually um, being filmed well after I've solved this issue. Um, I was not happy with the way that I originally filmed it, so, you know, this is your uh, your warning that this video will kind of be happening in some choppy segments, but that's okay because um, this video is not about the solution, it's about the process to get to the solution, because the solution is within these four here. Guess which one it is? You were correct, it was the DISA O-ring. So with these codes, what I did is I looked at the fuel trims and I was at a positive 10%. That is quite high. Uh, if I remember correctly, anything plus or minus 2% or so is considered um, either normal or acceptable. 10% to me is quite unacceptable. And if the DME, which is the um, German word or the German acronym for an ECU, if it detects a 20% fuel trim, positive or negative, for more than a few seconds, it will throw an engine code for both of these. Well, whichever one it, it thinks is suitable. In this case, I got both. And that's actually a good thing for troubleshooting. So the first thing that I did was check for vacuum leaks. Uh, vacuum leaks that mainly would affect both banks, you know, so every single cylinder would be affected. So the first part of this video is going to be me disassembling the intake system and looking at every, pretty much every possible place where there could be air leaking in um, to the vacuum system, or, you know, the vacuum side, which is um, after the throttle body or even before it with the intake boot. So basically anything that is unmetered by the mass airflow sensor is considered a vacuum leak. I didn't uh, find anything suspicious there. The next thing I looked at was the intake air temperature sensor, which is um, in the middle, at the, it's at the top of the intake manifold in the middle between cylinders three and four. And I checked that O-ring and it needs to be replaced, but I don't think that's where the leak is coming from. The next thing I did was check the DISA O-ring. And uh, for those of you who don't know, there is no such thing as a DISA O-ring because it doesn't have one. The sealing elements on the DISA valve are all molded into the to the part. There is nothing removable or serviceable. But what you can do is remove um, remove the O-ring around the circle boss from which it seals, and replace it with an actual O-ring. So um, if you're looking for the answer, you can just skip to the timestamp for that. I put all the timestamps in the description for this video. And then the last thing that it could be. Um, is the fuel filter regulator. I'm not doing any of that in this video. I have a separate video for that that I will be posting probably after this video comes out. Uh, so you can see how that's replaced. Uh, it's it's actually pretty easy. And if you don't know when yours was replaced last, it's a $60 part. So I think it should be, um, it should definitely be part of your regular maintenance every 50 to 75,000 miles, I think uh, that should be replaced. I guess that is one more thing I should uh, mention is my fuel trims were initially at uh, 10% thereabouts. I went on a 600 mile road trip and then they went down, actually, sorry, only after 300 miles of that 600 mile road trip, they were already down to 6%. And when I returned, they're down to 3%. And this is positive, And that means the engine has to add fuel. So, um, I haven't checked it since I saw the 3%, so it could still be going down. And these are in the long term, so I should clarify. These are 
long term. As long as I can see this going down, and 3% is beginning to be at the far end of the acceptable range, if it can get down into the 1% or 2% range, even if it's positive, well, I guess even if it's negative, um, I will consider this the solution to the problem officially. But so far, the long terms have been coming down over the last few hundred miles, and I will continue to monitor. To save some time, I, as you noticed, I did put a picture-in-picture um, -picture of a time lapse up here for um, disassembling the intake system. So right now I'm going to switch to, my, to the footage I took a couple weeks ago um, before I knew what the solution to the problem was. Mind you that uh, I did not know that until I did the Disa O-ring segment and the intake air temp, so this was filmed on one, at, on one day. These two were filmed on another day, and this I actually just did today. So I didn't know what the solution was until I got here. So I don't hold you up anymore. Let's just go into uh, checking for vacuum leaks, and you can see where all the potential vacuum leaks are um, in the M54 engine. Uh, and trust me, there's a lot of them, and uh, I'll catch you on the flip side. Here's a look inside the engine bay now. You can see in here that is looking really scummy, and it smells really bad. So this, so the unit that sits here is called DISA. It, uh, it's a four-letter acronym that stands for something in German. So now I'll show you what it is over here. This is a DISA unit. It's vacuum operated. So there's a little hole down here for testing it. You twist it a certain way, but it's worth it. This is the idle control valve. Um, this is the old style. It's, uh, it's electromechanical. There's a, a pin out here and these can stick. So if you have a rough idle or if the car doesn't want to idle properly at all, um, make sure this is clean and free to move like that. This is the lower intake boot. Inspect it for any cracks. Um, inside the this uh, accordion pleating here, they always crack. It'll crack anywhere there's a sharp line. But, you know, these are still nice and soft and pliable. I don't think there's going to be any issue here. Uh, this is the intake box. Uh, this is the mass airflow sensor. This could also be the problem that I'm experiencing is if this thing is dirty or if it is malfunctioning, but I've cleaned this several times in the past uh, when I was experiencing similar issues that I was able to solve. And this never did anything, so I think that's clean. Um, this tends to crack right in here. And then um, getting this seal correct is also important making sure this seal down here is correct, and then again, in, in, inspect all these um, accordion-style pleats. Make sure there's no crack in there. Again, this is nice and soft. I don't think my issue is here. Uh, there's one other place, and that would be right in here where the mass airflow sensor connects to the intake box. Uh, you can take off these clips, and that'll come up. But you've also got to remove this lower box. I've taken this all apart before it's a little bit of a pain actually it's not the most fun thing to do so now if you look right here that's the throttle body right down there that's that's one of the bolts this is the actuator section right there and if you look carefully here you'll see the ccv and you can see this one is the foam covered cold weather version and then there's a drain hose that goes down into the oil pan right there. It's actually, it's that one right there. It goes down into the very dirty oil pan. And that is nice and tight, so I don't think that's my problem. Uh, I really don't think the problem here is a vacuum leak. B 
be very, very careful when you lift this up because it will crack if you're not very, very gentle with it. Ooh, I don't like that. Ooh, come on. Ah, there we go. Okay. Now this thing is still tied down because there's a hose right here that leads down to the CCV. Look at that. Nasty. It's running all over the place. And that is what's going to be going through these straight into and there's some in there too. And that goes straight into the engine. Yay! All right, the system doesn't look clogged. But you'll notice any time anybody mentions any problems with this engine, 80% of the time they'll say something about CCV. And that's because that is the biggest weakness of the M54, is that CCV system. And that's also why the N52 engine is such a significant, uh, it's such a significant improvement over the M54 in a lot of ways. The N52 has weaknesses that this engine does not have, and they're more mechanical. But BMW really solved a lot of those, those problems with the CCV system. And they, again, they adopted other problems, but it do, the N52 doesn't have this. The N52 also has a much, much more simplified intake system that this engine just, you can see. If you've seen my videos on the Z4 with the N52 engine, you'll notice that, like, it has half the amount of wires and hoses and just things running around the intake side of the engine. This, it's more like a Subaru, honestly. And Subarus are just, man, they machine gun it with all of those, all the vacuum lines just everywhere throughout the engine. And it's pretty much all for the sake of emissions. So I don't really know where to go from here. How much you want to bet that is all caked full of that sludgy nastiness. Let's take a look. This is about as close of a view as you're going to get. And this is also why these engines have such problems in the cold and in cold weather. Yeah, it's got some. And it is actually pretty bad. It doesn't look so bad right here, but if you look down in further, it's, it's a lot worse. But it's not forming on the oil cap yet, which it'll do when it gets colder. That always happens, but you can see the problems I'm talking about, and you can see why catch cans are such a good idea on these engines. It's, oh man, it's, it's just very frustrating dealing with this stuff, if you can't hear from the tone of my voice. It's, oh, it's really annoying. So the problem I had last year actually stems from this CCB system. Uh, I had been running to work. My work was only maybe barely 10 minutes away from where I lived. And even though uh, at least once or twice a week, I would go for a longer highway drive to get the engine up to full temp and try and boil off all the moisture in the engine and have it get sucked through into the intake, it just wasn't enough. And eventually the CCV, the CCV system completely clogged up. Sorry, the CCV system completely clogged up and I got oil in every single cylinder. I pulled out all the plugs, like all of a sudden the car started smoking as if it had blown a head gasket. It was bad. It was just a huge trail, quarter mile back from where I had driven. That's how big this, uh, the, the smoke of, uh, the trail of the smoke was. And I pulled up spark plugs. There was oil sitting in every single cylinder. So it had sucked, what happened is it sucked oil up, probably from the oil pan, right through the CCV system, in through these it was a mess, and all I had to do really was take a vacuum and, a, and some compressed air and just let the car sit in a heated shop overnight, and that cured it, and it just had to burn off all the oil, which uh, doesn't do any favors to the cats. 
So here I have the intake air temperature sensor. This comes out of the top of the intake manifold right between cylinders three and four. I'll show you a couple quick images of that and where it's placed right now. And what I want to do is replace this O-ring here, if it'll focus, replace this O-ring. And then I also used some uh, mass airflow sensor cleaner to clean off the sensing unit here. Um, I may or may not have an O-ring that fits in my kit, but at the very least, I'm gonna take it off, try and refresh it the best I can. Um, and hopefully I will, I'm able to replace it. So I believe this is an eight millimeter by three millimeter O-ring. Um, actually, I will get you the dimensions or I'll, I'll put the dimensions on screen somewhere and then you'll know what this is. Um, it's listed as an eight millimeter by three millimeter, but I don't, I think the eight millimeter is talking about eight millimeter ID, then three millimeter wall thickness. Okay, unfortunately I could not find anything in my O-ring set that would fit this properly. I did try staggering two different sized O-rings, an eighth inch, um, I'll show you the ones I chose here. I had an eighth inch and a sixteenth inch O-ring, maybe it's three thirty seconds, but a larger and a smaller O-ring that would kind of make up the difference. But the problem is the ID is not big enough. Um, or I should say it's not small enough, even though the OD works just fine. So I don't have O-rings with a thick enough wall. They aren't quite three millimeters, so they don't fill up the space quite correctly. So all I did is I'm going to be reusing the original. I flipped it around and originally this O-ring was pinched a little bit. You can see that right here. So I hope that doesn't give me any trouble with flipping it around. And then I did add it just a little bit of silicone grease, just a light coat. Um, this might be a little bit too much, but so long as uh, you don't get anything from this flange forward, you should be fine. Something I don't know is how sensitive this temperature sensor is. I don't know if it's as sensitive as a uh, mass airflow sensor or if it's a little more robust than that. Something tells me it's a little bit more robust, but I would not um, chance it, so be very careful with this. So now to install this, make sure you have the tab, this push tab, at the roughly two o'clock position and slide it in this way. Uh, another thing to be very careful of when you're taking this out, as best as you can, clean out everything around this area because um, odds are dust and dirt will pack into these recesses in the sensor and that's going to fall directly down into the intake. The better you can clean it, the less you'll have fall in there, but I guarantee you something's going to fall in and you're just going to have to deal with it. Um, and then make sure you clean out all the grit from the walls in there. And then you simply slide it back in. This fit does not give me any sort of confidence. Um, and I tested the fit with the other two O-rings and it was about the same. So the ceiling surface is down in another um, counter bore. It's not in this larger bore, obviously. And then just put the sensor connector back on and that's all there is to it. Not... Uh... Not a likely leak on this engine, but I figure if I'm having potential vacuum leak problems, I wanna go over every single possible point where it could be failing. Something I did the other day is I replaced this um, upper vacuum hose. So this is actually not for a vacuum exactly. This is a fresh air source uh, that goes and matches up with one of the brake booster lines here and then goes, it, it ends up, back underneath behind the throttle body somewhere. Um, I don't think anything on this line further back is leaking because they are, um, they're, they have those permanent uh, hose clamps, the crimp style, and those are all very secure. So I still would doubt that those are a problem. Um, something else I will be doing 
is replacing an o-ring in here and i'll show you that uh shortly because i think this um this disa valve is leaking around its periphery but it also might have some sort of leak internally that would allow vacuum um into the manifold i'm just i don't know how these are even constructed so i can't say for sure if that is even possible but it it's not uh it's not impossible anything Anything can go wrong with the vacuum system on these engines, that's for sure. So in this part, the DISA valve, this is where I think a lot of my problems lie in terms of vacuum. Uh, as you can see, I removed this portion of the molded in sealing element. I think it's some sort of silicone. It, it feels like silicone to me. and. It comes off in strings and bits, and then you just have to keep picking at the little pieces that are left. I think I have it clean enough for what I need. The hardest part to get at is in this section right here, because this really gets in your way. So one thing that I recommend is get yourself um, one of these um, jewelers or you know ultra fine flat blade screwdrivers and push it up against the top push it up against this way and then press your finger and it together, pinch them together and then carefully roll it around and you can see you'll scrape stuff off of that front edge. And then you can push it down into there and then you can continue scraping. If you hear a gritty sound, then that is definitely because um, you are starting to cut into this um, glass filled plastic. Um, other tools that I recommend are a slightly larger flat blade screwdriver and then a sharp uh, pick. This sharp o-ring pick was really good to get in behind here. When, it, when the whole thing was intact, I went in behind here at about that angle and then just went around and was able to peel it off. And I was able to do that on the other side. Um, and it, it tears more than anything, and that's why there's so many so much stuff left. So... I'm going to wipe this up and then I'm going to install some O-rings. So I'll be right back. So here I have my O-rings. I ordered two sizes. This is a 57 by 2.5. So it's a 62 millimeter outside diameter O-ring. This is the one that I ordered because of my own measurements. And then this one here is a an SAE number 139 and this is what the internet told me to buy. This one is smaller, this one is slightly bigger. But you can see they're very very close. So I'm going to try the one that I measured first and see how that fits. And I'd say that is the appropriate and perfect fit. And you can see how the, the top profile of the O-ring there is proud of the flange. So I'm going to remove this very gently. I do have two of these metric ones, um, but I would really rather not wreck them if I don't have to, obviously. And because they're brand new, they're very easy to put on and take off. So here is the one the internet told me to use. And there's an awesome thread in a forum. I'll, I'll link it in the description um, that goes into this particular O-ring and other O-rings for the M54. Now that one sits a little bit more proud, which I kind of like, but it is a tighter squeeze. So I will try both, but you know what? I'm going to try the one that I measured first. Um, it seems to give more space in the O-ring groove and would might be less likely to pinch. And I don't know. I These are both Viton. These are um, the slightly more expensive chemical resistant Viton O-rings. So these um, aren't just the oil resistant. These are the, it's the good stuff. Oh, 
uh, let's go try that over at the car. I added some grease to both the O-ring and the ceiling bore. It's a bit tight, but I think I'm going to attempt to screw it down and see if it will um, pull in. Uh, I just really don't want to pinch the O-ring because that's going to cause more problems than having left it original. It's also possible that if it takes too much force to draw this in, that it may crack some of these plastic components. It actually looks like it's drawing in quite nicely, so I think I've got a good seal here. I keep going for the wrong spot because I've got the cover off from the lever arm for this little piston in here for the Vanos unit. Let's see if I can actuate that. I don't think I can. Oh, no, I can. There we go. So the other thing I was going to say, well, I think this unit might be faulty is I don't necessarily think that there, there's a bad seal in here, but I think it's either caked full of carbon from inside the manifold or something, maybe some of these vacuum ports are clogged up that it just doesn't really want to actuate properly. But is that gonna cause a vacuum leak? No, so if the vacuum leak is being caused by here, then there is a bad seal. Um, it just doesn't actuate smoothly, but it doesn't seem like it's leaking at all. And that's why I'm gonna call this part 50% condition. So hopefully this O-ring is gonna help a little bit. Um, I think my 171 and 174 engine code problems are kind of a combination of a bunch of little leaks and possibly still that fuel filter regulator, which I won't be getting in until next week. So my verdict on the O-rings, I would personally go with these ones, the 75 millimeter ID by 2.5 millimeter cross section. I think these ones um, are gonna fit a lot better than these ones because this was already pretty tight to get in that bore. And these ones uh, would have been even tighter because there was less space in the O-ring groove in terms of width. And these are a slightly taller profile. So I think these are the ticket right here. Um, I got these ones off, I got both of these off McMaster. Both these packs together, two metric and the 10 Imperial were like 13 bucks. So not too bad to have some extra O-rings in stock. I have a road trip coming up here, uh, actually tomorrow. And it's about, I don't know, 300 miles one way, so it'll be about 600 miles round trip. And I'm running on an engine that I would consider to be in 95% running order, um, only because of those weird fuel trim problems. I generally would call 95% pretty good, but you know, I don't like running my vehicles anywhere below 100%. So hopefully we made it all the way back here in one piece. As you can see, the uh, the DISA unit that I have is kind of on its last legs. It, they're spendy, I think it's, for the factory one, it's $300 to get the factory DISA valve. The aftermarket ones are like 160, I think. Uh, I haven't looked at prices recently, but it's in that ballpark. So it's, it's not something you just wanna chuck apart at the car and hope it's right, because it's getting to be on the unreasonable side for um, just the run parts of the problem. Hopefully you found some of that information helpful. Um, maybe it'll scratch your brain a little bit. If you're having these problems, it gives you uh, a few more ideas of where to look if you haven't checked some of these places already. Um, and then, you know, coming out later, probably next week, I'll have the video on the, uh, the fuel filter regulator because that can also contribute to this problem because if it's not, if this is clogged, if the, if the regulator isn't giving you the proper pressure, or if the fuel filter is clogged in any way, you're also going to be starving the engine of fuel, which the engine will compensate, compensate for by adding extra fuel. So I think that's all I'm going to have for today. This is already like a 30-minute video. 
um, and not many people like to sit through things like that. Unfortunately, I'd say take your time. Don't rush through life. Well, with that, see ya.